I want to welcome you to church. So glad that you are here and you are with us today. If you're new, you're hanging out for the first time and we haven't had a chance to meet. My name is Jack and I get to be one of the pastors here. And we're thrilled that you chose to spend time with us this weekend here at City Line. And for those that are tuning in uh, online, wherever you might be watching from, doesn't matter what city or state, no matter what county you are a part of our community of faith, and we love you. And uh, we want you to jump in the chats, uh, connect with our online team. Uh, they would love to track with you uh, on all things City Line as you uh, listen to us process through God. God's word today. Um, as you can tell, there's lots going on uh, in City Line Church, and that's exciting. And today is no different for our teaching. We're going to be jumping into a brand new teaching series that we're calling Everyday Dialogue. Everyday Dialogue. I think um, it, it's worthwhile now at 11 o'clock, and you've had enough coffee that everybody joins me in saying that. Can you say Everyday Dialogue? Ready? One, two, three. Everyday Dialogue. I want to kind of get that kind of in your heart, in your mind, kind of uh, ruminating in your thoughts, because this is an important series for us. We're going to be talking all about about learning to connect and communicate with God. Very simply put, this is a series that's going to center all around prayer. Prayer. What is prayer? Why is prayer important? What's the deal with prayer? Why does prayer feel like such a mystery? We have so many questions about prayer, but prayer is incredibly important. It, prayer has been significant for centuries, and it's not going anywhere. The question is, is are we engaging? Are we leaning in? Do we know where to start? Uh, the reality is we're going to spend the next six weeks together talking about prayer. So I'm giving you a heads up. As we prepare for summer, we're going somewhere. See what happens sometimes in summer is summer, uh, a, lot, a lot of times, uh, acts similar to uh, those that are, are recently graduated seniors. You get into senior year and you reach a certain point, you hit a wall and they call it senioritis. Oftentimes we get six months into the year and summer hits and the weather changes and it's blue skies and the suns are out and we get summeritis, right? We want to go somewhere. We want to do something. We want to check out somewhere else. But here's the reality. What we don't do in our relationship with God is somehow check out on God in the summer and then pick back up with God in the fall. Instead, we continue to bring God into the picture on our summer. We, we continue to engage with God throughout the summer. We continue to grow using summer practices or spiritual practices throughout our summer that help us understand God better. And one of those is prayer. It's a deeply formational practice. In fact, prayer is this process of ongoing two-way communication with God. I want you to know that up front. It's two-way communication with God. In other words, prayer is not a monologue to God, to somehow try to get God's attention. I love that prayer is a dialogue with God because you already have God's attention. God is already attentive to you. He wants to connect with you. He wants to hear from you. He's inviting you to connect and to communicate with him. Are we willing to take him up on his offer? Research suggests that most people pray. Uh, a recent study says eight out of 10 uh, U.S. citizens claim to pray regularly. In a typical week, two out of three American adults, or 66%, pray at least once. Another 68% of those who would identify as Jesus, a Jesus follower, said that they pray at least once a day. When daily, I don't know what's up with this number, but 20% more women will pray than men. I don't know if the women are praying for the men or, 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 or what that consists of, but, but that's what the statistics say, right? Uh, and so here's the reality. Prayer, while it's amazing, here's what we know. It's also confusing. It's also difficult. It's also mysterious all at the same time. It's one of those conundrums where, I, for, for me personally, in my own life, over the last several months, I have been walking with four different people, people that I know well, people that I've been praying alongside for a very real need in their life. And what's interesting is all four of those people have the same exact need. They're praying for the same exact thing, seeking the same God. For one of them, their prayer, it took six months to get some sort of an answer. Another one, it only took five days and there are two of them that are still seeking and praying. What's up with that? I have friends that have been seeking and praying for God to do something in their body, to heal their body, to restore their body. And they get excited because it seems like while they take a few steps forward and while things seem to go well for a while, suddenly there's a setback. What's up with that? And what am I supposed to do? Do I keep praying about that? Do I give up on that? Do I do, what, what do I do when it comes to prayer? 
So what we're trying to do is we're trying to engage. We're trying to engage with scripture, but we're also discovering both the mystery as well as the invitation of prayer. Why? Because as a church, we believe that one of the most significant things that we can do as a church is actually discover the depths and the beauty of prayer and and to make that as practical as we possibly can. The idea behind today is to kind of give us an introductory understanding, to give us something that we can start with, to give us a place where we can go and and some things that we can identify in our life. It's a part of what we talked about last week, that beneath the surface discipleship, that we don't stay surface level, but we dig down beneath and we see what's going on. We understand the most important informative practices in the life of Jesus, and we begin to apply those things to our life and as a church. Why is that important? Because here's what we know. Prayer is the source of Jesus' most astonishing miracles. It's the subject of his most audacious promises. Yet for most people, they find prayer to be boring, disappointing, sometimes just simply wishful thinking, and or all of the above. Prayer is a genuine struggle. In fact, the worst kept secret within church history of all time is that most people, maybe many followers of Jesus, would actually agree that they don't really like or prefer prayer. Don't get me wrong. We still do it. We still do it sometimes based out of mainly guilt or sometimes obligation or based on the circumstances that we're dealing with in our life. Others of us, we still pray even though we don't prefer it because somehow, some way, we know deep down it is actually good for us, which means that we've resolved to make prayer the spiritual equivalent of eating your vegetables. That you know somehow, some way it's good for you and I should do it. It's not my favorite, but I will. Because many of us say, especially in the church culture, we just want more meat. Ever heard anybody say that in church circles? If you're, if, if you're new to church, probably not. You're like, that's a weird statement to say, right? But if you've been around church for a long time, you know, people are like, I, give me the meat, pastor. Give me the meat. Give me the meat, <laughs> right? Give me the meat. I just want to go deep. I want to go deep. Give me the meat. I want to go deep, right? Not realizing that prayer is the avenue to which it takes you to a depth with God that you have not yet known. But if we forsake prayer, don't understand prayer, if we miss out on prayer, it doesn't matter how much meat you get, you're still missing a very real connection with the God who loves you and the God who cares for you. So I understand that prayer comes with a lot of baggage. We even tend to make prayer sometimes more complicated than what it needs to be. However, make no mistake, no matter your experience, here's what we know. Prayer is primary. In fact, I want to suggest today that it's impossible for us to grow spiritually without a commitment to prayer. How could you say that, pastor? I feel like I've been growing. I feel okay with my spiritual walk. Here's what I know. Prayer is the soil where every other spiritual practice grows. It's the soil where every other spiritual practice goes. So so here's what we want to do. We want to remove the barriers, the misconceptions. We want to gain a better understanding. We want to understand the importance, yet also the power and the impact that prayer can have in our life to where we reach a point that we actually fall in love with learning how to talk with Jesus not talk at Jesus. That's where many of us got our start, right? And that's not a bad place to start. We begin to say things to God. But here's the reality of us maturing and growing in our faith, that as we begin to pray to God, it goes beyond just saying things to God. And now we begin to learn to listen to God. We learn to hear from God. We learn to dialogue with God, not just sometimes, not just when things feel most pressing, not just in emergency situations, but here's what we do. It's everyday dialogue back and forth communication with us and and the Father. So where exactly do you start? If, If prayer is one of the most spiritual things that we can do, right? This idea of talking directly to God. And if prayer remains one of the greatest struggles in our life, where where do we start? I want to talk about what prayer is, but before we do, I want to help us to understand what prayer is not. Because much of our frustrations with prayer, I would suggest, are often created by our misconceptions about prayer. So understand just a few things about prayer. These are not going to come up in your notes. These are just extras that I would love for you. If you're taking notes, you should write these down as God triggers something in your heart. That's the goal of today, that as we talk through these things, God would begin to stir something inside of you that said, yeah, I think that's me. Yeah, I think that's where I'm struggling. Yeah, I think that's why prayer is so so hard or so difficult for me. But also we want to take next steps on what to do about it. So understanding what prayer is, is discovering what prayer first is not. And here's what we need to know that prayer is not. Prayer is not a formal presentation. 
It's not a formal presentation. We don't have to come before God with all kinds of pleasantries. Oh, far loving Father, how art thou? Oh God, way up high in the highest heavens and little old me way down here below on earth if you can see me in the sea of all these kinds of people. God, here I am. It's, it's me again calling out to you right? That, that's, not, that's not how we do prayer. It's not about the looks. It's not about the words. It's not about the sounds. It's about you genuinely coming before God. It's not this presentation. Prayer is also not giving God our wish list, that we come before God with some sort of wish list, that God, here's all my needs, here's all my wants, and here's all my desires. And if you can do it by the time I'm 32, God, then I'm, I'm good, right? Like you've helped me to accomplish my plan. And that's the reality. Oftentimes we go to God with our plans, And we want God to make good on our plans, but we have to ask ourselves the question in prayer, is God obligated to answer every prayer that we give to him, every request that we have for him, everything that we think we want, is God obligated to give us that? And as we wrestle through those things, we have to understand something important about God. He's not a spiritual Santa Claus. He's not a divine vending machine, right? That we want God's gift oftentimes. What happens when we want God's gifts is we get so caught up in the things that God can give us where we forsake the giver of those gifts, And we miss out on God completely in favor of God. Just what can you get for me? God, what can you get to me? That's not what prayer is. Prayer is also not a performance or a show to try to impress. All right. Has anybody ever been in a situation where somebody's going to lead out in prayer and there's always that one, I'll do it. Right. You know them? And you're like, good, better than me because they know how to do it. Right. Like then you've watched them do it. You've seen them do it. Jesus says you have to guard against being seen by others or, or, or praying in certain ways where it's like this, this whole kind of like, you got to add all these bells and whistles and pieces to it. That's not what God wants. It's not a performance. God wants your genuine conversation. God's not impressed by all the extra things or your marathon prayers. You know, sometimes we think we got to go before God and if we don't give him at least an hour in prayer, then guess what? He hasn't heard anything. As if God's ears need to be warmed up somehow. The reality is, is Jesus even himself said, guarded against using lots of words in prayer. He says, what if you made it clear and concise and just came with honesty before God? Interesting way to go against the things that maybe we've been taught in our life. And lastly, uh, prayer is not a, a spiritual business transaction or a contract. It's not a business transaction or a contract where we often go before God and we say, God, here's the deal. This is what I need you to do in the way that I need you to do it. And if you do that for me, God, here's what you're going to get out of me. Here's what you'll get in return. God, I promise that if this time you will once again deliver me, rescue me, help me, come through for me in this situation, then God, I promise that I won't do X and Y and Z anymore. So God, are we good on that transaction? God, are we good on that business contract? I promise God. And here's what you need to know about me, God. God, I really mean it this time. Because this is not the first contract that you willingly ripped up before God. Am I right? We all can see that that's not what prayer is about. It's not trying to get God to meet us somewhere, get, get, get something from him or, or try to get him to make good on what we think that we need in our life. So what is prayer? Well, first, before we understand what prayer is, then we have to ask ourselves the question is, well, how often do you actually pray? How often, how much time do you actually give to prayer? And is it true that prayer is both mysterious and, and also awesome, but at the same time confusing and frustrating and, and, and oftentimes feels a, a little less than, than boring, right, when, when we often pray to God? How many of you have had those moments where you've been in a situation where it feels like our, our, my prayer is just not even being heard? My, my, my prayer doesn't seem, I've heard people say, it's not going anywhere uh, above this ceiling. It just feels like I pray and it just kind of nothing, just just nothing. To which we would ask, well, also, not only how often do we pray, but what, what motivates you to pray? What exactly is your motives as it relates to prayer? All questions that God invites us to wrestle with, especially as we engage with scripture, because all throughout the whole of the biblical narrative and into the early church history, we understand that prayer was the anchor for all of Christian life, all of following Jesus. 
In fact, we read in Acts chapter two, after this, this mighty move of God known as Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit comes in and totally wrecks this upper room, right? And people just kind of go to this next level of worship and prayer before God. And then people begin to speak in other known tongues and the gospel begins to go, go forward in those languages to all the ends of the earth, just as Jesus said that it was going to. You see this awesome display that is happening, but guess what? Oftentimes they're in the same situation that you and I are in, where we go to church sometimes, we have this awesome encounter with God and oh man, it feels so good. But then there's Monday, but then there's Tuesday and then there's Wednesday. And we feel like, well, here's, here's, here's what I experienced God on Sunday, but I still got to contend with the rest of my week. They were in the same situation. So you know what they did? They took their prayer life and their spiritual formation seriously. And here's what it says that they did. Acts 2, 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They said, we're going to be serious about following Jesus, that we've been now filled with the Holy Spirit. And as now we've been filled with the Holy Spirit and Jesus is no longer physically present with us, the one way that we're going to stay connected to God is through continuing to teach his word, continuing to get together as a community or as a church, as the body of Christ. We're going to continue to break bread together. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to devote to prayer. You know what I love about that word, devote to prayer? They didn't say that they're going to pray sometimes. They didn't say that you pray, um, you know, when you can get around to it. They didn't say that, you know what, in case of emergency, treat prayer like that. In case of emergency, break glass, right? And then go before God and really get God's attention with a really mean, earnest prayer. No, no, no. They said, we're going to devote to an ongoing, consistent life of prayer that keeps us communicating with God, that keeps us connected with God. Why? Because this is central to our growth and maturity as we follow him. Why? Because that's exactly what prayer is supposed to be. Prayer is the primary way that we connect and communicate with God. It's our everyday dialogue. In fact, psychologist David Benner, he says it this way. He says that prayer is the soul's native language. Last week, we talked about the idea of the soul. We, we talked about how is your soul and that your soul is, is what holds all the parts of who you are together. And if any one of those parts is suffering, right? Struggling, then guess what? Your soul is struggling. Yet the soul cries out and the soul's native language is this idea of prayer. The soul's desire is to be connected with God, to be communing with God, to forever be in the presence of God which is why I love what Philip Yancey says in his book. He says that if prayer stands as the place where God and human beings meet, then I must learn about prayer because most of my struggles in the Christian life circle around the same two themes, why God doesn't act the way we want God to and why I don't act the way that God wants me to. Prayer is the precise point where those themes converge. Has anybody ever felt that way? I mean, here I am, like, God, why don't you just do the things that I'm asking you to do? And God, how come you can't just come through when I want you to? And God, how come it's always like a last minute thing with you? How come it's not like way ahead of time? You know, why can't you help me to know this way far in advance, God? But then at the same time, we look at our lives and we're like, yeah, well, we're not really living God honoring ways. And God is inviting us to something different. And there's this, this disconnect that seems to be between us and God. And he says, you know what bridges that gap? He says, prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. In prayer, we converge on that gap and we get together with God. Why? Because prayer is the center point of life with God. The priority of prayer is found in one way or another on almost every page of the scriptures in every chapter of church history. In fact, the apostle Paul in writing a letter to the church in Thessalonica, these little churches that he would go around and plant all around the Mediterranean rim, he says something so fascinating. He says, this is what it's like to continue to grow in your relationship with God. He says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do you understand what he's saying there? He's saying, I want you to rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Jesus. You don't want to know what God wants for our life? You, you want to know a part of God's will for our life? He says a part of that is that we would be a people of rejoicing, a people of joy, a people who, who actually pray continually. They give thanks in all circumstances to which we say, hey, Paul, time out. Hold up. Do you actually live life? Do you, do you know this is Los Angeles? Have you ever, have you ever driven on the 710? Have you ever driven on the 405? Have you ever driven on the 91? I mean, just pick a freeway. freeway. Have you ever been on there? Do you work with my boss, Paul? 
did you grow up in my family? You know, the family that put the fun and dysfunctional? I mean, what's the deal, Paul? Do you know? Do you know anything about my life? Because here it is. You're talking about, it just sounds easy. Rolls right off the tongue. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Because, oh, that's God's will for your life. Oh, so much for you, Paul. I mean, you obviously haven't lived much life until you realize Paul is writing these letters from an interesting place. So you realize that when Paul is encouraging people, most of his letters that he wrote, a good majority of them, that are at least the most significant ones that are read by the church, were coming from Paul as he sat in prison. What is he in prison for? Uh, not because he broke a law or broke a crime. It's because he was ministering about Jesus. He was talking about the good news. And there was such an uproar about the good news and so many life changes that were going on and happening. They didn't know what to do with this, Paul, but it freaked out the Roman government. It freaked out those that were in charge. And so the only way that they thought that they can quiet Paul, let's just lock him up. That'll work. How well did that work? Well, Paul would say, uh, I know I'm in a tough situation, but I'm going to rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all my circumstances, in any given situation. And this idea of pray continually is what strikes me though. What, what is he saying about praying continually? What exactly does that mean? I would suggest that Paul is talking about, again, a lifestyle of prayer in that we understand that prayer is the oxygen for a life with God. That prayer is, is, is the very air, the very breath that we breathe. And so if we understand that prayer is the very oxygen for a life with God, then we have to ask the question, then why don't we pray? Why don't we pray more? Why don't we pray with a greater ease? Why don't we pray with a greater regularity? Why don't we pray with a, a greater confidence or, or a just kind of a greater stirring before God? What's the deal with prayer? And here's what we know. Prayer is hard for a lot of us because it comes with different obstacles and different roadblocks that, that can make prayer difficult. And on the surface, we feel like we have an understanding of some of those. But today I want to take us beneath the surface again. Today, I want us to, to maybe address some, some deeper things that maybe we don't know exist, but maybe if we bring those before God, God would show us something different. See, on the surface, many of us say things like, well, the reason why I don't pray is because, well, I don't really know what to say, or I'm not really sure where to start. You know, I, I, I'm not sure that I, I have the right words to say to God. And so because I don't know where to start and I don't know what to say, that I just don't really say anything, you know, because I mean, I, I don't, I just, I, yeah, I, I just don't know. And then others of us would say, well, it's not that I don't know what to say. It's not that I don't know what, what, what I probably should say to God. It's that, you know what, life, life is, is just life. And, and, and so all these things demand my time between school and work and family. And, I mean, it just takes up a lot of my time. And while I intend to pray to God, and while I wanted to spend time praying with God, here's what, I, what happens. I, I just seem to be just kind of, you know, out of time. And, and I'm, I'm just, if I'm honest, I'm just busy busy. I'm really busy. I'm just, I get too busy. And then I look up and <gasps> where'd the day go? Anybody ever there? Like, wh where did it go? And, and then, and then one day turns into two days and two days turns into three days. And then, and then suddenly I, I remember somewhere down the road, man, it feels like it's been a while since I talked with God. And man, it feels like I'm, I'm disconnected with God. And here's what I know about feeling disconnected with God. The more disconnected with God that I feel, the easier it is to not pray. Because why bother? Why bother? And then there's others of us that say, well, it's just distractions, you know, uh, constant distractions, distractions here or there. Let's not forget it's 2024 and we literally carry the internet, internet around in our hand. You know, everything that we want, any form of escapism, anything we want to look up, anything that we need a fascination for, anything in that moment, it's really hard to pay attention to God or be alone with God or intentionally focus on God living in a soundbite world. Because honestly, if you can't tell me in about five to 10 seconds, 20 max, then guess what? You're losing my interest. Some of you have already lost interest in this talk and I welcome you back. <laughs> because you know that it's true. Because do I really want to know about prayer? Should I know about prayer? I mean, he said six weeks. What would it look like to go on a six week vacation and then come back, you know, and like, you know, pick up in the fall. You know, we get all these thoughts in our mind that simply pull us away. And while all these answers seem to make sense, might be true based on our own experience or your own acknowledgement, even in church, here's the reality. I know that it's so much more than that. There's deeper things that lie beneath the service. And I want to suggest that that underlying tension that often relates to prayer is really an issue of our very real, real fears and concerns. Author Tyler Stanton says it this way. He says, prayer makes us anxious because it uncovers fears that we can ignore as long as we don't engage deeply, thoughtfully, or vulnerably with God. You ever thought about that? We stay surface level with our prayers. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep, 
right? We know that one. God, I should pray over my food right now because God, I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to work a miracle before my eyes. Turn the fat into protein, God. And Lord God, remove the calories altogether because I forgot to count today. And so Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, would you allow this food to be a blessing and a nourishment to our bodies? And God says, what did you order? <laughs> Are you with me? So, so, so we're, we're trying to, to understand what does it mean to actually pray and to go beneath the service on what are the, the real fears and concerns that we have that maybe we didn't know that we had needed awareness of or, or maybe really never understood. And again, where do you find yourself in the story? Because sometimes I think that the beneath the service issues start with the fear and the risk of submission. The reason why we don't go deeper in our prayers and really seek God for our prayers and spend intentional time with God and stay surface level is because we're a people that desire to maintain a certain level of control in our lives. We love control. When we have everything fully uh, figured out, when we can understand everything completely and know how things work and know how things are going to go, then it gives us a sense that we mastered it that somehow we've got full control because we've mastered it. If I understand it, that means I can master it. And that idea of mastery actually elevates our sense of control and, and helps us to make sense of a chaotic world, right? The world is chaotic. There's all kinds of things that we don't understand. So if I can understand a few things and master those things, it gives me a sense of control. And if I can't master it for some reason, then guess what I do? Well, I just don't do that, <laughs> right? I change my major, right? I, 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 just, I, I do something different. I, I make a different decision. I throw it out altogether. The same is true of prayer. We think that we can come to prayer, and if we can't figure out prayer and can't seem to control prayer or control God in our prayers, then here's what we do. We tend to want to throw prayer out. But here's the tension that you and I have to discover as it relates to prayer. Prayer cannot be mastered. Prayer cannot be controlled. Prayer is always a means of submission, of coming under the authority of God. Coming under the authority of who he is and what he says and what he feels best. In other words, to pray is to willingly release control. That scary thing that we don't want to do. To actually let go, as we say in these coin cliches of Christian life, let go and let God. Right? We always say we want to let go and let God. And it sounds nice in theory, but have you tried it? It's a lot harder when it comes to trying it. Why? Because to pray is to re 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 Excuse me, to pray is to risk believing in someone beyond ourselves, to risk trusting God with the best possible outcome for whatever prayer I am bringing to him in my given situation. In other words, while I know what I would like to see and what I want and what I hope God will do, here's what I know I got to do. I got to bring that to him in prayer and I have to surrender it to him. I have to submit it to him. It's under his authority now. So if what I want for my life or what I want for my marriage or what I want for my potential spouse or what I want for whatever it is going on in my life, I have to submit that to God with the understanding that God might see it entirely different than I do. That's hard. It's difficult. It's a fear that we have when it comes to prayer. Not only is it the fear of the risk of submission, but it's also the fear of uncomfortable silence. Many of us don't like silence at all. We're uncomfortable with any form of silence, right? It makes us feel awkward. You always know uh, if you go to a community group, right? You go to a community group and, and there's a certain type of person there where you know, we, we give our community group leaders a question or different questions. You ask the question and then it's like, question is asked and then you're like, 1,001. 1,002, 1,003. You get to about five seconds in and nobody said anything. You're like, well, okay, okay. So, so I'll give you an example. I'll, I'll give you an answer. You know what I mean? And you're like, wait, hold up. You just asked the question and you're gonna answer it? Like give somebody time to process it, to think about it. Like I think people are thinking what they want to say in response, but you don't like the awkward silence. That's exactly what we call it. Silence is just so awkward. And so we don't wanna sit in that silence and actually do the thing that's one of the hardest things for us in our life. And that's actually to wait, to wait on God. What if I come before God in prayer and, and what if I get this awkward, disappointing silence? <laughs> well, what, 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 if, what if God stands me up altogether and he just, it just makes me feel like he's not even listening? See, prayer means the risk of facing silence in a world that's addicted to noise. We're so addicted to noise and addicted to everything that we need clamoring about us because we don't want to feel alone and we don't want to feel just by ourselves. And so what many of us will even do is that before we can actually sleep, we have to turn on noise. We have to have a TV on. We have to download some app that has all kinds of different noises attached to it so you can put some sort of noise on so that you can try to your best get some sleep. But then the reality is you don't want to feel alone because silence is deafening. 
to be left alone in silence, to be left alone with your own thoughts, to be left alone with who you really are, much less in prayer, to be left alone, just you and God, creator of the universe, the God who we've already acknowledged knows everything there is to know about us, but yet still feels awkward in his silence that he's not saying anything to us. But what if we were able to, to take the risk? There's the fear of submission. There's the fear of silence. There's also the fear of exposure. Exposure. Why is there a fear of exposure? Because prayer always requires intimacy. Prayer calls us to intimacy. If we're gonna connect with God, it draws us to closeness together with God. And to think that I'm before God and that I'm going to risk being fully exposed. To pray that prayer in Psalm 139 that David said, God, help me to know me. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. He says, know my fears. Know more about me. Not realizing that in verse one, David also says, you already know me, God. But many of us aren't sure that we have that desire that we wanna sit comfortably before God knowing that he knows everything about us. Why? Because we know that some of our prayers that we are praying to God and some of the things that we are doing in our life, man, we know that they aren't in a right place, which means that we understand and recognize and know that God sees our motives. And when God begins to expose those motives before us, again, it's, it's incredibly uncomfortable. We're not sure how to handle the risk of exposure, but if you've ever, ever been married, you know that exposure is necessary for ongoing intimacy. You know, it's interesting when you're dating, you can cover up a lot of stuff. When you're dating, you can always dress your best. When you're dating, ladies, you can always rock that makeup, you know, get it just right, you know, put the perfume on, coming out like, Pah, right? <laughs> but what happens when you get married? you realize that he doesn't take you home at the end of the night, but now you live in the same house and 24 seven, you are there. And the question is, do you go to sleep with that makeup on? Do you wake up with it still on? If he's only known you for the makeup that's on your face, then he doesn't really know your face. And so there's this idea of this risk of exposure that, uh oh, what's going to happen the first time I come before the person that I pledged my love to and they see me for the real me. Like they don't see the Mac makeup counter that exists in the bathroom, but instead they, they see me for, for, for real me, uh, every flaw, every blemish, my, my real skin tone, all of that stuff. Uh, what, what's going to happen? And it feels very uncomfortable. It feels very risky. Why? Because we live in a world that is used to covering up, to building walls and barriers. And it's the same thing that we're used to doing before God to covering up before God, all the way back in the garden, the garden of Eden, right? We go against God's best for our life. And what do we do? We run and we hide. God comes looking for us in the cool of the day. Where are you? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, I don't, yeah, I'm over here. What are you doing over there? Well, I've become accustomed to, to running and hiding for fear of exposure. And then lastly, we often fear doing it wrong. Doing it wrong. If I'm gonna pray, I fear doing it wrong. Why do we fear doing it wrong? Because not only do we not know where to start, we don't know what words to say, but we, we're not sure that we know how this prayer thing really works, as I said. And so now we don't know what to do. I mean, when I, if I'm gonna start to pray, like, do I start prayer like an email? I mean, do I start it like a letter? Do, do you ever find interesting that some of us, we've been taught to approach God? Uh, Dear God, <laughs> can I ask you a question? Where is he? Where's God? I mean, isn't he close? Close is the very air that we breathe. We approach God like if he's somewhere on vacation. Like if God's gone on a long trip, he's somewhere over there. He doesn't have time for us, but we're gonna say, hey, dear God, can I just, can I borrow your attention for a moment? God, I mean, think about that. For, for those of you that, that grew up in, in your home, right? And with, with, with your parents, whether it was a single mom or whether it was a single parent of any kind, or maybe your grandparents raised you or whatever. Did, did, did you approach them? Uh, uh, hey, dear mom, dear, dear mom, dear mom. No, you don't do that. Why? Because she's in the room with you. She's not somewhere over there doing something. She's not uh, uh, ignoring you. Well, she, she's, she's, she's giving you her attention and you just get to approach her out of a relational understanding of, hey, mom, mom, or dad, papa, father, whatever that might be. But oftentimes we push God at a distance. We don't know how it works. We're not really profound with our words. We don't know religious words. So we're not confident, much less comfortable praying out loud. If you thought fear of public speaking was crazy, I mean, try praying out loud. That's even crazier. Why? Because we think that we don't know how to do it. We think that prayer might work for some people, but it doesn't really work for me. It's interesting that Thomas Merton, he wrote that if you want a life of prayer, the way to get it is by praying. If you actually want to know how to pray, you pray. If you actually want to know where to begin in praying, 
you use your words. If you want to know, if you know how to talk to a friend, to a family member, to a coworker, to a boss, then you know how to respond to God because God invites us to a real conversation with our heavenly father. He even invites us to see him as friend. Now there's plenty of biblical passages on prayer. There's no shortage of places where we can start looking to help us wrestle through the complexities of prayer. And where do we start as we wrestle through all these fears and concerns that we have about how we're going about prayer. But there's no more clear, concise understanding about prayer than Philippians chapter four. Once again, the apostle Paul from prison, mind you. Philippians chapter four, he writes to encourage the church. And you know, the overarching resounding theme of Paul's letter to the Philippians while he writes from jail is joy, joy. Paul, you're in prison, joy. Paul, you don't know if you're getting out tomorrow, next week, next year, joy. Uh, Paul, you are often chained to the guard. Guess what? Joy. I got somebody 24 seven I can talk to you about Jesus, joy. Right, Paul's just, I mean, he just, he's built different, Right? Like we know that about Paul. Here's what Paul says in Philippians chapter four, verse four through seven. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Verse six, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Verse seven, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Often we want scripture to speak to us very, very clearly. We would love for God to just give us all the steps necessary. God, just give me A, B, C, and I'll be faithful to follow. But it's fascinating that God, through his word, begins to speak to the church and says, when it comes to prayer, here's what I'm inviting you to do in prayer. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And here's what happens. This exchange takes place, right? This holy exchange change happens, where the peace of God, which now transcends all of our understanding, begins to guard our hearts and our minds. He says there's something supernatural that happens if we can get our minds around, don't be anxious about anything, but instead begin to pray about everything, to which we push back and we say, I don't know about that. Sounds too good to be true. Sounds easier said than done. Not to mind you that while Paul is in prison, we understand that, but it also sounds like Paul doesn't know what he's talking about, or at the very least has never been anxious because I know what anxiety is like. You know what anxiety is like. Anxiety is like the underlying hum of our life most times. In a hustle, fast-paced world, constantly on the go, always off to the next thing. We never can slow down long enough to be with God. Not only that, but Paul's suggestion, I mean, it just sounds crazy. So I'm just supposed to pray. And then suddenly, poof, peace. Suddenly, anxiety gone. And many of you push back because you're like, yeah, I've tried that. I tried to take God at his word and I've been leaning into that. So although I tried it once and it didn't happen, then what do we do? Because we don't understand why it didn't happen. Like I said, we push away from it. But Paul is inviting us back to continuously pray, to not just pray sometimes, not just pray when you're anxious, but to get in the habit of learning how to pray to God consistently. This is what we're invited to do in prayer. So wouldn't we take God up on his offer to do it? Why is it so hard to take God up on his offer to do it? Because maybe many of us are more accustomed to and familiar, maybe even comfortable with the relentless underlying anxiety that we have instead of the peace that surpasses all understanding. We become so accustomed to, to being more familiar with the fatigue of the pursuit of control and trying to get everything that we need in our life instead of the release and the freedom that is offered to us when we cast all of our cares upon Jesus in prayer. Sometimes we've gotten it twisted and backwards. And now I know for me, especially for me, I'm far from the expert at peace. I want to be a non-anxious presence, but most of the time I, I, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in the weeds and tangles of, of the glimpses and moments of peace here and there, yet at the same time experiencing the weight and the angst of everyday life. I know what it's like to live in that tension, yet here's what you and I have to understand today. This is the offer. 
Paul points to an offer. He points to a holy exchange, a peace, a supernatural sort of peace that we can't logically reason out. He said, it's a peace that transcends our understanding. So while we can't figure it out and while we don't have all the answers and while we don't fully understand, the good news is, is I don't have to. Why? Because I'm choosing to offer it over to God and I know that he understands and that he's figuring it out and that he will be faithful to work it out even in spite of my circumstances and the chaos around me and all the fears that seem to exist. How does this exchange happen? He says it's by the means of prayer. Prayer, coming before God in prayer. So what makes prayer so important? And how is prayer so impactful? I love what Martin Lloyd-Jones said. He says, if of all the activities in which we engage and which we are a part of in the Christian life, there's surely none which causes so much perplexity and raises so many problems as the activity in which we call prayer. To which I say, thanks, Martin. That's really encouraging. To which we would follow up with the question then, if that's the case, then why should we pray? Why pray? Why even engage? Why even try? Why, why even go beyond this surface level understanding of, if you say, I, I could potentially be dealing with some of these fears and I would say, well, that's the key. With some of those fears that we might not have always been aware of that maybe God is revealing to us today, here's what he's doing. He's inviting us to, again, this exchange. To where I begin to seek him and I begin to pray. And as I do in exchange, I begin to experience his peace. So why would I pray? I, say, I would say it's because of the same reasons that you live in a lot of fear and anxiety. And the first is this. I'm gonna give you four things to kind of help interact and combat the fears that you have in life. Why should I pray? Well, first, it's because prayer is about relationship. Prayer is about relationship with God. And I, under, I, I know there's a lot going on in life and I understand there's lots that takes up your day. But I would say the thing that you are most desperate for, that I am most desperate for in our life, whether we can articulate it, have acknowledged it or realize it or not, is a relationship with Jesus. And I love what Paul does. Oftentimes when we read Philippians chapter four, we immediately go to six and seven and we say, anybody that has anxious, anxiety, worry, fear, here's what you do. You just got to give it over to God and you got to pray more. And as you pray more, then guess what? There's this thing that happens just like we talked about today. But the most important piece that we miss oftentimes is what Paul actually says before that. Because I don't actually think that you can experience the peace of God and the release of the anxiety that God gives. I don't think you can experience the internal peace even when your external world is going chaos unless you first understand what he says in verse five. What does he say in verse five? I love very simple words. He says, understand the Lord is near. God's not somewhere out there doing something absent of you. The Lord is near. We're told over and over again in scripture that God comes close that God is close to the brokenhearted, that God is close to the very air that we breathe, that he is Emmanuel. He is the with us God. He's a God who listens. He is the God who speaks. He's a God who interacts with the creation that he loves so deeply. But the deep fear that robs us of our prayers, that robs the power of our prayers is the lie that the Lord isn't near. That many of us have bought into the lie that, 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 that God has somehow forgotten about me, that I, maybe I'm not in good hands, that, that maybe because God didn't speak up and say something on the first pass of prayer, that, that maybe now I, I, my future isn't secure and that I'm unsure about what's next, let alone can I actually trust God. See, it, it's, it's worry at the end of the day that, that, that drives us far away from God than instead of, of coming near. Yet prayer is in one of the great discoveries of prayer. And what makes prayer so significant is that, is that we, we, we get the closeness of a God who actually loves us, a God who actually cares for us, a God who wants to be in relationship, a God who says, I'm willing to walk with you. Well, why does that make prayer so important? Because prayer is about presence before it's about anything else. Understand this, when we build a relationship with God through prayer, prayer does not begin with the outcomes. Prayer is not about just what I need and what I want. Prayer is the free choice to simply be with the Father, to connect with the Father, simply because I prefer and love his company. I want to be with him. I want to know him more. I want to understand him better. I want to be able to communicate with my heavenly Father so I know that he knows me. See, the fundamental purpose of prayer is to deepen our closeness and connection with God. And the real, this real life-giving experience with God. And ultimately then, if that is the case, the reward of prayer is not the results that I get from prayer, but it's the relationship built with Jesus through prayer. That's the real reward of prayer. So why should I pray? Because it helps me build a relationship 
with God. Well, why, why should I pray? Well, because the second piece is that trust comes before faith. Trust comes before faith. So we say we fear silence or the awkward moments of silence or God not saying anything. But the things that calm, the things that are fear about, the, this idea of fear that exists in our life, the things that cause us so much worry, the thing that calms those fears, understand me, is not more faith. And I know some of you bought the t-shirt, fear over faith. And I'm not trying to come at that idea or understanding, but I'm trying to help you see it from a different perspective. The thing that helps us to overcome fear is not faith. The thing that helps us to overcome fear is trust. It's trust. It, prayer, prayer leads us to a place of trust. Prayer is not the place where I understand everything there is to know about God. It's not that I understand that everything uh, about what God is doing in my life or around my life. Instead, prayer is the place where I learn to trust in the character of the God that I pray to. I begin to trust who he is. I begin to trust his faithfulness. I begin to have confidence in him and what he can do. I know that I can't do it in and of myself. So I'm going to put my trust in God. I'm going to allow God to continue to prove himself to me. See, understand before we can have faith in God that he's going to answer any given request, we simply have to learn to first trust in who God is and what God can do. See, this, this leads us to this deep-seated place of trust. Trust says that I can pray while at the same time, I don't understand. Trust says that I can continue to pray even when I know things don't look good. See, Jesus hasn't revealed us a God that we can perfectly understand, but Jesus has revealed us a God that we can perfectly trust. And that's good news. And that's why we should pray, to learn how to put our trust in God. Why should I pray? I pray because it's about relationship with God. I pray because trust comes before faith. And three, I pray because complaints and frustrations are welcomed. I pray to God because my complaints and frustrations are welcome. Why? Because I've built a life of trust. I trust who God is. I trust in the magnitude of God. I trust in his bigness. I trust in his faithfulness right? Many people come to me and they're frustrated with the situation and they're kind of bothered with God about a situation. And they say, can I, can I actually share that to God? Sometimes I feel like saying this to God, but I don't know that I can. I feel like telling God this, but, but you know, I want to say, I, I, you know, I don't want to disrespect, you know, I, I, I just don't know that I can. And so you know what we do? Instead of saying to God what we really feel, we end up suppressing those feelings. We suppress those complaints. We stuff down those frustrations. That frustration turns to pain. That pain turns to more anxiety. That anxiety turns to sorrow. And that sorrow turns to discontent. And that discontent turns to bitterness and so on and so forth until now we're feeling some kind of way about God. We resent God for not doing what we wanted him to do, when he, oh, I thought he would do it, how I thought it should be done. However, if we are willing to take our complaints to God, if we're willing to share God with God with what's going on in our life and really what we're feeling, then guess what? It draws us closer to God. And we understand that God is actually big enough to take it. He not only understands what we're feeling, but he, he's big enough to take it. And oftentimes, those are some of our most powerful prayers when we're gut level honest with God. You're like, how could you say that, pastor? Because have you ever read Psalms? Have you ever read the book of Lamentations? David, right? Well, one of the, the, the major writers of the Psalms that became the prayer book and the song book of the people of Israel. You read some of those things and everything seems to be going well at first, right? Last week we read Psalm 139. Oh, you know me, you form me, you knit me together. Woo, all these, you're fearfully, wonderfully made. Praise God. And then it's like, God, get them. God, crush them. God, I hate those who hate you. And God, I'm frustrated. And you're just like, whoa, David needs some professional help, right? But yet at the same time, this is not just any David. This is King David. This is a man after God's own heart. Why? Because of his willingness to be gut level honest before God, to share his real feelings, that God invited him to this place of trust, of vulnerability, to be fully exposed before God, to share what he needed to share, to say what he needed to say so that he could get a better understanding of who God is and just how God comforts and just how God brings peace and just how God provides and just how God comes through in ways that we didn't know possible. That leads us to continue to grow and thrive and mature in this ongoing relationship with God. God's big enough to take it. These are powerful prayers because they're honest communication, not well-prepared speeches. I choose to pray to God because God invites my complaints and my frustrations. And then lastly, I choose to pray to God because here's the reality that somebody needs to hear today. You can't mess it up. 
I know you thought you could. I know you thought you didn't know where to start, but you can't mess it up. Richard Foster says, by praying, we learn to pray. By actually talking, we can't mess it up. If you know how to talk, you've been given the ability to talk. If you know how to talk to someone in your home, someone on your job, someone in your neighborhood, if you know how to verbalize any kind of communication, then you know how to pray. So how do we talk to God? We use our words. You vent, you laugh, you unload. In fact, prayer is the most, in its most basic form is simply calling out to God, saying, God, I need help. I love what one author says. He says, while our prayers can be awkward, our attempts may often feel weak, but since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it, not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. So what I love about God is that God invites us to take a next step with him. The question is, will we? Will we see for ourselves what Paul talks about, this anxiety for peace, this exchange that God promises through prayer? that happens in our hearts. Understand, this peace is in the internal fruit of an, of an ongoing, growing prayer life. It's not the external fruit. In other words, life can still be chaotic and life can be going out of control, but you have a peace that passes all understanding in your heart, even in that moment. It doesn't mean that it's the absence of war or the ceasing of striving. It simply means that even though things are going crazy, I have peace in who I know God to be. I have confidence in his character. I know who he is and I've placed my trust in him. And so as I continue to trust in him, now I can actually walk by faith and not by sight. Not by my power, but by his power and strength, says the Lord. How so? Because Paul says, The Lord is near. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. He's not forgotten. He's not given up. He's not pushed you away. In fact, the Lord is near and he's inviting you to more. But understand, prayer is more practice than it is theory. Prayer is much more practice than it is theory. So where where do we start? And here's what I want to suggest. Contrary to popular belief, prayer doesn't start with speaking. Where does prayer start? Prayer first begins with the right posture. What is our posture if we're going to learn to take a next step in praying before God? I submit Psalm 46 to you. One of the well-known passages that you probably have the t-shirt, you probably bought the bumper sticker, or at least grandma has it stitched on some comforter in her home. (laughs) One that you all know well once it's finally spoken. Psalm 46.10, the sons of Korah. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The right posture to come before the Lord in prayer, to begin to pray, is not with all your words and everything you need, but it's to sit before God and learn to be still, to quiet the noise, to cause the hustle to cease. This idea of be still comes from the Latin word vacate, where we get our English word, vacation. What is God inviting us to do? He's inviting us to come and be still. It's an invitation of prayer that says, take a break, (laughs) release control, return to God. See that progression. Lose control, give up submission. Prayer is a significant invitation, an invitation of prayer anytime, anywhere, together with God. No matter if you are here, no matter you are there, no matter you are somewhere else, it's anytime, anywhere to stop playing God over your own life to release control, to simply remember who God is while at the same time remembering who you you are and moving forward trying to not get those two mixed up. He is God and we are not. He knows what he's doing even when we don't and he can be trusted. And the way that we get to know him better, the way that we connect with him, the way that we communicate with him is in prayer. Prayer is how we reorient our lives around who we know God to be. Or as Philip Yancey says, prayer is the act of seeing reality from God's point of view. I love that. Seeing reality to God's point of view. The goal, as John Ortberg says, is to to see all of our life and to speak all of our words in the joyful awareness that God is present right here, right now with us. How would we begin to live all of our life in prayer? 
with the goal being to understand that we speak our words with the joyful awareness that God is present, that the Lord is near. He's right here. He's right now. He's with us. I want to offer one suggestion as you go about your week, and it's simply this. Pray as you can, not as you can't. Pray as you can, not as you can't. Start right where you are. Well, what do you mean, Pastor Jack? Start, start where you are. I'm saying pray as you can't, not as, as you can't. Pray, pray at what comes natural. If you can't pray for 30 minutes, then don't pray for 30 minutes. Pray for three minutes. And if three minutes sounds excruciating you to you, try one. If you can't pray with confidence that God's hearing every single word, and if you can't pray with joy and excitement about what God's going to do, then instead bring your frustration and bring your pain and bring all your questions and offer those before God. Just pray as you can, not as you can't, not as someone else is doing or someone else that you heard. Don't use eloquent words. Just come before God. Bring all your run-on sentences. Bring all your mindless mumblings, whatever it is. Bring all of your tears, those tears that you tried to come before God and you tried to utter the words, but they won't come out because they're choked by the tears that are running down your face. You know what's interesting? When we can't get those words out because those tears are running down our face, God knows exactly what we're saying. He knows exactly what we're experiencing. And that is the beauty of prayer. It's the beauty of connecting with and communicating with God. That we can come as we are and we can pray as you can. How do you pray as you can? You keep it simple. Don't need to be elaborate. Doesn't have to be out of control. You keep it real. You don't got to be somebody that you're not. You don't have to be a spiritual scholar. You don't have to act like you know all these religious words. Instead, be real. You don't even have to pray for an hour. I grew up in a, a certain kind of church environment that it was like, the longer you play, prayed, the more you thought God was going to hear you. And then I read scripture and I realized that Jesus himself said, stop using so many words. Be clear, be concise, get to the point because I know what you have need of before you even ask. Whew comes out of relationship. It comes about praying as I, I, I can, not, not as I can't. So I keep it real. I keep it simple. And here's what I need to do. I need to keep a regular rhythm. This is ongoing. How do you experience the peace of God for the exchange of the anxiety in your life? It's not going to happen in just one setting. Is God a miracle worker? Can he do that? Can he totally zap you of that anxiety? Yeah, but guess what? Tomorrow there's going to be more things to worry about. So the beauty of prayer is I don't have to only come to God one time or certain times. I can consistently come to God in a regular rhythm of prayer, trusting in Him, walking with Him, doing life with Him, communing with, spending time with my Heavenly Father because I enjoy His company. And as I do, over time, I begin to see the shift begin to happen. The exchange begin to happen. That more joy comes in my life. More peace comes in my life. As I release control and I turn the anxiety over to God and I allow God God to be God because I am not. It's the beauty of prayer. God is inviting us to come with the understanding that 99% of prayer is just showing up with the willingness to engage. That's our invitation to you this week and over the next few weeks as we continue to unpack the beauty and the mystery of prayer. Would you just continue to show up and willingly engage together with God? Would you start today praying as you can, not as you can't. Father, I thank you for the way you're working in this place. I thank you for your spirit, God, that we feel in this room. God, I thank you for the connection that you are making with your people as you help them to know, God, that you see where they're at. You know what they're going through. You know what they're experiencing, God, and you invite them to communicate with you as raw and real as they can, God, Lord, as honest as they can, as simply as they can regularly, God, over and over again. God, you never get tired of hearing from us, Jesus. Many times we've bought into the lie that we've, we've asked you for so much and for, for so many things that you don't want to hear us now. But God, you never get tired of hearing your children. God, you invite us to come to take up your offer for the great exchange as we trust in you. So Father, it's our prayer today that you would give us the strength and the courage to take that next step. And we thank you in advance for what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.